you may go to your seats this morning. What happened to Dad? You said, preacher, come on, man. Don't let this be a daddy message. It is, we get something out of it, everybody, male and female. Amen. Ash, also, as we go forward, always keep in your mind, uh, there's some things that happened this week. I'm sure everyone has made, been made aware of the tragedy that happened in uh, the church in uh, South Carolina. Uh, it is a tragedy. It is a tragedy that nine people lost their, lost their lives, even though they were believers. And we know to be absent from the body does mean to be present with the Lord. But in the way in which they died, uh, for us, for me, I don't know about for you, was, was uh, unexplainable, was just uh, unfathomable. But it is the day and time in which we live. And the honest truth is that Jesus talked about that they would, there would be this persecution against Christians. I, I know we were thinking maybe it would be, it would be like it was um, back in the day that you know when Jesus was talking about the persecution that it happened to those disciples. But in actuality, some of those things are going to happen today, and I'm talking before the tribulation. There's just going to be a wave of. of evilness and because of the size of the time, a wave of hatred towards Christians that uh, would, be, would be lifted up and raised against us because we are bearing the name of Jesus Christ. And that's just something you and I are going to have to wrestle with. And that's why I, I want to preach soundly and doctrinally and also asking for the power of the Holy Spirit because as a Christian, it's not going to get easier. This is not going to get easier. Well, preach, I need to quit. Well, I'm telling you, you'd rather take it not being so easy now than to take the hot, uh, uh, total separation from God for eternity later on. I, we'd rather, as Moses did, the Bible says Moses, he, he'd rather suffer for a season than to endure and, and mess around with sin. And so it's like that for us as Christians today. If there was ever a time that we needed to grow in grace, it is right now. If there's ever a time we need to grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, it is right now. If there's ever a time in your life that you need to get bolder for Jesus, it is right now. If there's ever a time you need to get serious about your Christianity, it is right now. Amen. Now is the time. Now is the day. There's no more waiting. We cannot continue to wait. We cannot continue to, to do our own thing and say, oh, eventually, or maybe, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. No, my brothers and sisters, the day that you hear his voice, he tells us to harden not our hearts. And this is the day, my brothers and sisters, that we as Christians, as believers, we need to get bold in Christ Jesus, fall in love with Jesus Christ, so that he can give us the strength and encouragement and the confidence we need to live the remainder of our days here on planet Earth. Because one day, Jesus is coming back. One day, the Savior is coming back for his own. He's going to take us back with him. But in the meantime, in between time, there's much work to be done. This isn't my message. I just felt like I needed to say it to share with you. If there's ever time to get serious about Christianity, it is absolutely right now. There's a serious decline in churches and denominations where people are no longer holding to any kind of religious truths. There's no absolutes. It's like whatever you want to believe, it's okay. And it, that is, that is, that is uh, from hell itself. Doctrines of demons, if you will. Seducing people away from the God of truth into our, our own truths. We are our own gods. It's your destiny. You have the power for your destiny. Man, please, you need, to, you need to realize God created you. God is the one. You, you didn't create yourself. This morning, the long clock might have woke you up, but really, the long clock didn't give you breath to wake up. It was him who sits on the throne, and who looks down, and the Bible says, he who has pity on us, he looked down and said, I'm going to let him wake up one more day. Are you grateful this morning? I, I know everything might not be all right, be great, but I'm still grateful to be alive. Because that means God is still has an opportunity to work in my life and to use me and to do great things for me. I took about three minutes of my time to exhort you this morning. I want to talk about what happened to Dad. From this particular context, in this story here, I wanted to have a little context. We're reading where Jesus is on his way 
to be crucified. And it's while he's on his way to be crucified, we're introduced to this man named Simon of Cyrene. Let the church say Simon. Simon. Of Cyrene. Cyrene. Cyrene is a place in Africa. Some will say that it's possible Simon was an African American. He was black. I can't say African American. He wasn't in America at that time. He was black. <laughs> but please hear my heart and understanding. That matters not to me. And the day and time in which we live. Now watch this. Have you noticed the rise of racism in our world today? Some say, oh, it's going back to back in the days. And I say to you, what it is, is nothing more than a trick of the devil to draw our attention away. Look at this. Listen, religion, I use religion or Christianity is on the decline. But what's on the incline, is on its way up, is the talk of homosexuality and that agenda. What's on the incline is uh, racism and how blacks and whites are, are uh, something that's always been there, but, but there's just more attention added to it. There's all these things that are popping up, grabbing our attention, that are really of no substance, but Christianity is on its way down. It's a trick. It's a ploy. It is something the enemy is using to get, get people off focus and off balance. And what we do is we, we now we're going to have civil rights. But man, I tell you, there is no better rights than the rights that you have in the kingdom of God. Amen. And in the kingdom of God, some of that civil rights stuff doesn't even hardly matter because we live by a different kind of set of laws. We love our enemies. We do things because of the love of God in our hearts and not because we, we want to keep our rights. If the truth be told, the Bible says we're going to suffer some things anyway. If we let God be right, he'll take care of all our rights. That's right. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So this man, Simon, here, who is uh, in this text we're pointing out, might have been black, but that doesn't matter. That's not a real good point to have. Here he is now being forced to carry a cross. And a couple of things I want us to point out as we ask this question, what happened to Dad? Uh, is that this young man has two sons. They he listed out as Alexandra and Alexander and Rufus. I can imagine after that situation happened, he was forced to carry a cross. I wonder how he felt and how he looked and how he had to explain that to his sons that he was forced to carry a cross. We'll talk about that, the cross, and what that looked like, what that meant. But there are three things I want us to highlight today, just for structure and so you can follow along where I'm going. What happened to Dad? Here's the first point I want you to see is that he was following tradition. What happened to Dad? He was following tradition. This is in verse 21 says, A certain man of Cyrene, Simon, was passing by on his way in from the country. All right, so Simon of Cyrene was passing by. He was going into Jerusalem because remember this, it is time for the Passover to be celebrated. Jesus is going, uh, Simon is going down to Jerusalem with just like millions of other Jews to come in and celebrate the Passover. Preacher, what is the Passover? Well, the Passover was to be celebrated because it was the time when God, uh, uh, I don't use that word, when God delivered Israel from the death angel. It's an exodus. If you're taking notes, just jot it down, dealing with the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. This is what God said. Tonight I will go through Egypt and kill every firstborn man and animal in Egypt. In this way, I will judge all the gods of Egypt and show that I am the Lord. But the blood of your houses, but the blood on your houses will be special and uh, will be a special sign. When I see the blood, I will pass over your house. I will cause bad things to happen to the people of Egypt, but none of these bad diseases will hurt you. You will always remember tonight, it will be a special festival for you. Your descendants will honor the Lord with this festival forever. This is what Passover was. When he said he put there was blood on the doors, I'll pass over you, he had them to take the blood of a lamb, and smeared on all the doorposts, all the doors that were of the children of Israel because God was coming in to judge Egypt because Pharaoh would not let God's people go. And so when God sends the death angel to bring judgment to these captors, the Bible says what happens is 
is that the firstborns of the Egypt died, but those who had the blood on their doorposts, they were all right. That's correlation for us today, that when the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives, God's judgment passes over us. Let me say it again. When the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives, the judgment of God is removed from us. That means God sees us as justified and he no longer will judge us for our sins because Jesus paid for our sins and his shed blood covered what we've done. It is just as if you never sinned if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. So if they came into uh, Jerusalem to celebrate this Passover, what God had done for them and delivering them out of Egypt. But even sometimes, brothers and sisters, we follow tradition. Sometimes we follow some things that have no heart to them. We follow some things out of nothing more than tradition. Maybe we come and, and we are going to church out of, not out of devotion, but out of duty, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes we come, we give but we don't give generously because we don't want to seem greedy. We give, but it ain't generously. It's not willingly and openly and freely. It's like that in participating in, in, in we have religion with God, but no relationship with Him. That is why the Christian church is on a decline. Because there are people that are actually sitting in the pews every Sunday, and they've never said, Jesus, I surrender all to you. They never said, Jesus, you come and take control of my life. Yes. Instead, it becomes a religious form where they come in, they worship, and the preacher preaches, and he prays over them, and it's, hey, I got my blessing for the week. And you need to know that kind of Christian living is very shallow. That kind of living is shallow to the fact that there are some that have just never confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior. Simon came to the sacrifice. He came to sacrifice for the Passover. But you'll see that he turned around and met the Lamb who was sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. This is important. What happened to Dad? Well, he was following tradition. Number two, let me show you, not only was he following tradition, but he was also following orders. Look in verse 21 again. Let's we'll stay in 21. And they forced him to carry the cross. And they forced him to carry the cross. Preacher, what is the reason for this order? Here's the reason why they told him to carry the cross. The crucifixion was a humiliating process for anybody, for a criminal. Number one, it, no Roman citizen would be crucified it was, unless they were really a criminal. And for a Jew, this what to see a Jew be crucified, it was un, unimaginable. It was, it was humiliating. It was degrading to see a man, a Jew, being treated like a pure criminal. Prisoners at that time were, were forced to carry their own cross. It may have been the complete cross that had the cross with the T on it, or just a beam of the cross, which weighed maybe 30 to 40 pounds. But they would have to take that cross and march up to the place of crucifixion, where they would put nail them to the cross and, and place it into the ground. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus was tired, but the text says something was going on with Jesus that he could not carry his own cross. I'm going to put in your remembrance maybe what was going on with Jesus, why he could not carry his own cross. We talked about it before, but that night, that night when they picked him up in the garden of Gethsemane, did you know he had been up all night long? And the Bible says that by the time he got to the temple guards, they mocked him and they slapped him and they spit on him. And then he moved from the temple guards to the religious leaders, the people in charge of the church. And they spit on him. Watch this. And they beat him. The religious leaders did. They beat Jesus with their fists. And they slapped him. And they mocked him. By then it was getting daylight. And then they got before Pilate's soldiers. And here's something we all remember. Jesus was scourged. You remember what the scourging was, don't you? The scourging was that cat of nine's tails. That whip that had nine uh, lashes to it. And in, in, nine whips to it. Nine parts to it, and it had glass, and it had bone, and it had fragments of metal, and the end of this whip, and Jesus was whipped with this to the point to where his back was exposed. He was laceration. It was very brutal and bloody. It was a terrible scene, but did you know he did this just for us. Amen. That's why I pray we don't do anything out of duty, but do it out of devotion to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He suffered before being put on the cross. 
He suffered, and the beating was so, in those days when they went through a scourging, people died just from the blood loss. People died, the muscle ligaments were torn. There was, there was great pain, and there was, this body was shredded like a greater than it was. It was terrible, and by the time Jesus is about to carry his cross, you can imagine how weak he must have been, how much pain he must have been in. But even after the scourging, he still had to go before Pilate's soldiers again, and they stripped him naked, and they mocked him, and then they hit him with a stick on the head. Then that's when they said, Jesus, now pick the cross up and go up to Galgotha. And so something is going on. I am assuming Jesus is worn out. He's exhausted. He's tired. But here comes Simon of Cyrene. And the soldier says to him, pick that cross up and carry it for him. The reason why is that I believe Jesus was tired. But here's the reproach of this order. The reason of the order, he was tired, but the reproach of the order was that those Roman soldiers had the right to tell anybody to do whatever they wanted at that time. And they had the right to tell a citizen, you do this and do that and do this. And so they looked at him and said, I want you to carry that cross, and you better carry that cross. But remember, the cross is a humiliating thing. The cross represented a guilty person. The cross represented a criminal. A cross represented one who was, who, was, who was to be judged harshly. He deserved what he was getting. But you and I know as believers, Jesus didn't deserve not one lick that they gave him. They, Jesus did not deserve not one bad remark, they, not one mocking, not one hit, not one spit. Jesus did not deserve any of the things that they did to him. But because God is still yet faithful, here comes Simon, and Jesus didn't even have to bear the guilt of the cross. But Simon did. If I were to see Simon today, I'd say to Simon, I would really say to Simon, thank you. Because you carry the cross that we should have carried. You carry, Simon, the cross that you, I should have been carried because I was guilty in trespasses and sins. I was someone who didn't love God and was far away from God and who was, who was into religion and doing spiritual things but had no spirit in me. I was like that. And Simon came along and he carried the cross. Though it was humiliating, I praise God for Simon carrying the cross. Amen. He carries this cross. Why didn't he fight back? Isn't that interesting? If you use the today's kind of young man who's in their early 20s and, you know, growing up, uh, today's kind of young man, uh, if the soldier would have said, uh, pick up that cross, well, let, let, me, let me make it 2015. The popo rode by, you know, they got Jesus in handcuffs and they marching him down to the courthouse and then and then the bailiff says, you pick up that pick up that cross and you carry it for him. Well, one of the things our people would do right about now, I ain't picking nothing up, player. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Yeah. It will be a fight right there. Yeah. Hey, brother, you going to go to jail. I don't care. They going to disrespect me. <laughs> Bro, don't, don't act up. They going to beat you down. I don't care. I don't, I don't care. Oh, Jesus, help us. Help us. Foolishness, absolutely help. I was watching this comedy. I like comedy shows. I like I like watching stand-up comedies who are clean. I can't handle the, the dirty guys. But I was watching Sinbad, and Sinbad said something revelatory to me. And he said, he said, you know, he said a lot of these young men now they grow up without fathers and they don't learn that there's somebody bigger and better than they are. He said, in the household, when you got a dad in the household, you learn that dad. He ain't nobody to play with. And dad gave you this sense of respect and, and, and fear, which every young man, every man, every person needs to have a healthy dose of respect and fear. Because there's always somebody who's better than you. It's always somebody who's bigger than you, who's more wicked than you. You listen, I know you're bad, but there's somebody. The man, they don't care about you or anything else. So Sinbad said that, that a lot of the things these young men, they grow up without a father. Some of them they do. And, and if they do have a dad and dad isn't being the man, they don't have this sense of respect and fear. And so I thank God Simon, Simon recognized something. He could have fought back, but he decided to do what the guard asked him to do. And so should we, my brothers and sisters. 
I don't know what his conversation was when he got home to his sons. Daddy, why did you carry the cross? Because they told me to. <laughs> Son, if I, had, if I had not carried the cross, I may not have made it home. That's where wisdom comes into play. Hey, that's where humility comes into play. Dads, and that's the message we should tell our sons continually. My grandfather used to say all the time, if you don't listen to me now, he said, there's somebody that you're going to listen to. If you don't calm down and hear some instruction right now, there's somebody in a place of authority that you will listen to. You might cuss all the way there, but I guarantee you, when they put you in the hole, you in the hole. When they lock you up, you are locked up. That's a message we must continue to preach. Where none of us should say, well, they just don't want to hear that. I ain't going to tell them nothing else. Plead with them, beg them, urge them, just do whatever it takes and give them the truth. And if they end up in the place where they have to be confounded in order to obey, well, praise the Lord, they're still alive. Amen. God still has opportunity to work in their hearts. Are you guys with me today? Yes. And so this young man, Simon, thank you, Simon, for at least being willing enough, humble enough to carry the cross. Many of us today are forced to do some things we don't like, but yet we know we have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. men sometimes we're forced to work on jobs that we don't like so we can provide for our family, and it's a good thing. Uh, many of us are forced sometimes to work at a less job. I, I know some young men that are forced to work at a less uh, place that they, are, they could do better at, but because of their criminal record, they can't go anywhere. They're forced. I, that, that's why I'm telling you, keep pushing it into your children that if they want to have a life that they can enjoy, keep, keep them out of the system. Mm -hmm. that's right. Keep them out of the system. Fight hard to keep them out of the system. Don't be their child's friend. Be their parent. Because right. I'm telling you, I don't care what color they are. They, they, the, once they're in the system, they're in the system. And it's a hard fight. It's a hard road to get themselves out of the system. It's, it's looking for jobs that you, you could do, but because you have a felony on your background, they, they won't accept you. Even if you give your life to Jesus Christ, unless the Lord somehow exonerates your record, that thing follows you, and it takes only God sometimes through his mercy and his favor to open up doors. But how many know God is able? Come on, God is able. He's a preacher, no, it, it, that book has been too bad. No, God is able. And that's why we turn to him because he's the only one that can change our hearts. Can you yes. say amen? Amen. Many of us, we, again, again, especially men, have, are forced to do some things that we don't like. Yeah, we're forced to provide for. I, I know some young men that have had to they provide for a child that they later found out wasn't theirs. I know a young man right now who's, who's, who's uh, his... His baby mama is forcing him to pay more child support, and he is working his butt off. He is, he is honoring his obligations, but because she wants more money to get her hair done or go clubbing or do whatever, she's trying to put the man on him to get more money out of him. I know plenty that won't pay. Won't even, won't even pay the phone. And there's some good ones out there that will handle responsibilities, and then there's some bad mamas that are that are that do some things. Women ain't getting on you today. <laughs> Simon of Cyrene did for Jesus. Listen to this: even what Simon Peter did not do. Did you remember with Simon when Simon was with Jesus? Peter was with Jesus, and he said, "Lord, I'll die for you." Yeah. Man, no, 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 Jesus. I die for you. We'll go down together. And at the end of the day, Jesus, who? I don't know who you're talking about. You say, Jesus. You mean Jesus? No, Jesus. You no, no. He denied Jesus three times. Simon of Cyrene did what Peter, who walked with Jesus for three years, could not do. He walked with him. He carried his cross. Simon of Cyrene did for Jesus what you and I could not do. He carried the cross that we should have carried. I'm almost finished, church. We looked at, hey, hey, that, that dad, what he did was he was following traditions and he was following orders, but finally he, was, he became a follower of Christ Jesus. It's in verse 21. I want to show you the clue there. It says simply, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. What? That's it? Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Simon believed 
even in this humiliating situation, he gave his heart to Christ. It is believed that Simon, if you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this same brother is mentioned in three out of those four Gospels, that this event took place, that he had this encounter with Christ and that he himself believed. The evidence that he believed was that his family believed. Because Simon's faith, it was believed that he led his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, to the Lord. Alexander and Rufus are sons whom Mark mentions. And while Mark, who Mark wrote the book of Mark, his audience is to Gentile believers, Mark it writes it in a way where people, these people know who he's talking about. So he names them. When they put a name in the Bible, when the author is putting a name in the Bible, it's generally because that person is known. These two men, Alexander and Rufus, the sons of Simon, were known to these people. And so he mentions to them that steady Simon, who is the father of Alexander and Rufus. These two men were well known in this community. Not only that, but it's funny to mention in Romans chapter 16 verse 13 that Paul himself makes mention of Rufus in one of his greetings. And he said that Rufus was one who was chosen by the Lord. And when he said that, not only did he say about Rufus, but then he also talked about Rufus's mother and said that his mother was one who helped him in ministry. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that this man's family was changed because Simon was changed. And dads, men, if we ever want to have a family that is following God, we first must follow God. The statistics say that if the dad gives his heart to the Lord, that family, about 80% of the time, that whole family is coming to the Lord. A dad has that kind of influence. Dad has that kind of power. Dad has that kind of swag, if you will, in the Lord. That if he gives his heart to God, that God can change him and he can set this man's whole entire household in the right direction. Can you say amen to me? Amen. So what happened to dad? Dad gave his heart to Jesus. And his sons did such, did follow. His sons, when you know, they were working for the Lord, and now their names are mentioned in the Word of God. The question for all of us is, for men especially, man, am I following Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ the Lord of my life? And does my family know Jesus? Does my family, is my family concerned about the things of the Lord? And I tell you, we ought not to rest that good without that prayer being made nightly, daily. Father, don't let my child leave this earth till they, had, till they say yes to you. I can't determine what condition they're in. I'm not praying for a great life. I'm not praying that they have this splendid life. I'm not praying that for my children because I don't know where God will want to send them. He may send my child out to Africa to do missions work. I don't know where my God will send my children. I'm not going to pray that they have a life of luxury because it usually turns into a life of laziness. I don't want my ch children to have that. That's not my prayer for them. My prayer for them is that they would know Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ would be the head of their lives and that Christ would guide them wherever he wants them to be, wherever he wants them to go. Because one day, children, you need to hear me. Church, you need to hear me. One day, Christ is coming back. This is not our home. That's right. This is not the only place you will ever live. We have a place, a building that's not made with hands. That's eternal in the heavens. We have a place where there's no sunlight it's just the light of God that brightens the whole entire Jerusalem, this new city of Jerusalem. That's a place that there's no pain, there's no misery, there's no sorrow, there's no working, there's no toiling, there's no disease, there's no arguing. Is that my baby mama or is that my baby? It's none of that foolishness going on. Is that my second wife? Is like, oh, she going to see me? She going to, no, no. No, there's none of that going on. There's no contention, no tension in heaven. There's only peace. There's only joy. There's only reward. There's only, there's, there's Jesus there. And then the day's coming when we will receive a crown for what we've done. The works we've done. And if we're smart, we'll just lay that crown right at Jesus' feet. Amen. We'll just give it to Jesus. Because, Lord, I would be nothing without you. 
I wouldn't even witness correctly without you. I wouldn't love my husband or my wife correctly, Lord, if you were not in my life. So, Lord, this is really your crown. It takes Jesus, my brothers and sisters, to live a life that's pleasing in the eyesight of God. Man, I pray that we would follow Jesus. Jesus made this one statement, and I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of here. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, tell him first that he must deny himself. Watch this. Take up his cross and follow me. What cross is that? It's the cross of suffering. It's the cross of not being like the world. It's the cross of being, being someone who's different. It's the cross of putting our family first. It's the cross of putting, putting Christ in our homes, praying with our children, praying with our wives. You said, preacher, you said, my, my husband's a mess. I tell you, God is able. Preacher, my husband, my, my husband ain't what he's supposed to be, and neither am I, but I know God is able. And all we, I believe what we should do is continue to pray and lift up men, and we should pray and lift up our young men. As a church, we should do that for each other in this house. That every now and then y'all call a brother's name in this church. The Lord bless that brother. Bless him. Well, may he be the man of God that you've called him to be. He may not have to, it may not be about preaching, but it's about the life he lives in the midst of his family. Yes. Yes. Simon, what happened to dad? Dad Simon? He found Jesus. And so did his family. And I think that's precious. Let's pray together. Lord, how wonderful. It is, Lord, to be in the presence of your people and in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for Simon, Lord, who bore this cross for our Lord in his time of suffering. Lord, we praise you for that. My Father, the question on the table for us is what, what has happened to us? What are we doing with the life that we're living? Are we following you or are we just following our little dreams, our little thing, our little way? Lord, I pray, Lord, today as we open the altar for prayer, Lord, that we would give our hearts to you in a way that we say, no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Lord, that we would say, I'm denying myself. I'm going to stop putting myself first, Lord, and put you first. And when I do that, my family will be taken care of. My needs will be taken care of. Lord, you will use us. Lord, I pray that you would use every man and with the sound of my voice, Lord, in an impactful way in their homes, with their own children, even with children that are not theirs, but they have some kind of influence. I pray that our men, oh God, will be godly men. Not men of God, but godly men. And Lord, I also pray or if there's a man in the house or a man amongst our fellowship or if there's a wife who has a man who is not serving you, oh God, I pray that the power, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit will convict their hearts and they will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But as we open the altar, Lord, would you please bless us? Would you please pour out your spirit upon us? Would you please give us hope and confidence and courage and peace that everything's going to be all right? This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.